Nothing could have prepared me for the summer that I finished school. My friends and I were young, we were free, we were full of life. And then I got the call that my friend Tom had slipped on a cliff and died. If you've ever had a call like that, you'll remember the feeling. Perhaps with the news of Shirley this morning, you, you have that feeling right now. Like time stops moving, like the gravity in the room suddenly changes, like you've stepped into a different dimension. And whilst I'd known death before, that summer, the reality of death, it hit me like a bus. At Tom's funeral, I remember looking at the, uh, the booklet with his face on, and uh, I distinctly remember realizing that one day there will be a little booklet with my face on. At some point, we all end up with a little booklet with our face on. I want you just to uh, imagine for a moment that this jar here is your life, and the marbles each represent one year. We tend to assume, I think, that we all have perhaps at least a few left. At age 18, no one is even counting. You think you're a sort of marble tycoon, endless marbles. Um, and there are apps now that you can get on your phone that will roughly predict, based on your health, how many years you have left. Um, but what Tom, Tom's death taught me was that actually you, you never really know. Maybe you have 20. Maybe you have five. Or maybe you're already down to your last one. It's possible. I think that in the past, people considered their mortality a little bit more often. Perhaps far, they were far more familiar with seeing dead bodies. The, the reality was that a simple illness could suddenly kill you. Now, did you know that his, historically, pastors would go into their studies with three items? They'd go in with a portion of the scripture, a candle so they could see it, and a skull. And the, the idea was that the skull was a reminder to them that life was fleeting. So but before the skull was the kind of icon of bikers and punk rockers, it was the icon of the church pastor. Um, all over Europe, archaeologists have been finding chapels and crypts where human skulls have been bricked into the walls for people to see. And there's often the same inscription in the room that says, what you are now, we used to be, and what we are now, you will be. If any of you have ever been to the, the famous Chapel of Bones in Portugal, there's a poem that starts, where are you going in such a hurry? Pause on your travels. You have no greater concern than this one before your eyes. Consider the dead. It's good to reflect on your similar end. Now look, I'm sure no one's taking inspiration for their hall stairs and landing here. <laughs> A little bit sort of morbid room, but you see, many in the past, they recognized that it was good for us to consider our mortality, our death. And of course, we do reflect on death today, particularly probably in our movies and TV shows. But I think in our corner of the world, we're much slower to talk about death. It's just not very British, which is what we say whenever we don't want to talk about our emotions. Uh, one YouGov study found that 68%, 68% of Brits are afraid of death, walking around afraid of it. Because, you see, despite all of our amazing achievements and advances as a race, we are still ultimately ruled by death. Whoever you are in life, whatever you achieve in life, eventually you end up on your last marble, and that's frightening, because let's be honest, we don't want to think about ourselves as just a face on a booklet or just a skull in a wall. And so many people today, well, we just ignore it, sort of like a child, putting their hands over their eyes, just hoping it goes away. Others, they try and fight it. They get on the exercise bike. They drink their kale smoothies, all good things, but really just delaying it. Some try to embrace it. There are some philosophies that will try and encourage you to embrace it, but 
Just pretend it's not so bad, but of course our tears tell us the real truth. I want us to look today at a better way for us to deal with death. There is only one person who has shown anything close to mastery over death in the long annals of human history. And it's him I want us to look at this morning because I I really believe that he has the power to not only change your life, as so many people will claim to do, but he has the power to change your death. Now look back with me at John 11. The book of John, if you're new to this, the book of John is one of the historic eyewitness accounts that we have of the life of Jesus. Thomas Arnold, professor of history at Oxford University, uh, famous for his history of Rome, he said, confirmed that these documents are historically reliable by every standard. And so rejecting the events recorded in these documents, well, it can't be done using the historic method, but only because your feelings tell you that you can't believe what they contain. The text we're looking at today is dynamite. You see, up until this point in the story, if you've been with us, Jesus has already said and done some incredible things, and the crowd are wrestling with who Jesus is. So if you look back just in chapter 10, verses 19 to 21, you'll see there in those verses that that people were, were trying to work out Jesus. Some said he was mad, others said he was bad, but others said he was God because they say, oh, how can someone mad or bad open the eyes of the blind? But what Jesus does next really melts some minds. In chapter 11, verse 1, we hear there's a man called Lazarus who is sick. Now, Lazarus, he was the brother of Mary and Martha, close followers of Jesus. And he's not just got the man flu here, serious though we know that is, ladies. Uh, Lazarus is properly sick, sick. Like, as in, if he doesn't get help urgently, he's going to die sick. Thankfully, Jesus is just down the road. Jesus has been in Jerusalem. Uh, We find out that that's only two miles away. In chapter 10, verse 40, uh, we're told there that he'd, he'd left Jerusalem now to go where John baptized. Still, he's only just a few miles away. But here's the first enormous surprise. Look at chapter 11, verse 6. When he, as Jesus, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, the text doesn't say Jesus was wrapped up in important business. It doesn't say that Jesus couldn't possibly get away. It just says he waited. Not yet. They didn't have watches back then, so Jesus just looked at his wrist. I don't know. <laughs> he waited. Verse 14, Jesus then tells them the news. He says, Lazarus is dead. Now, here comes the next enormous shock. Verse 15, Jesus said to his, says to his followers, For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, so that you may believe. Why did Jesus wait for Lazarus to die? Why did Jesus say he was glad that he waited? Well, it's because Jesus needs to prove something of incredible importance to them and both to us and to us that he is not just master over sickness, but he's also master over death, master over the grave. You see, if Jesus had rushed immediately, he would have only proved once again that he's master over sickness. In order to prove that he is master over the grave, somebody needed to die. Verse 17, over the, pa- over the page, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, four days, I think, is of some significance. There were some ancient people. It was quite common for ancient people to believe that the soul remained in the body for three days. That's not a biblical idea, by the way. It's just that some people believed it. Now, Lazarus has been dead four days. Point being, Lazarus is dead, dead. Scientifically, after four days, your internal organs have already decomposed. The body has begun to putrefy and smell. Insects are usually at work. Lazarus was 
dead, dead. In case you think this was a kind of David Blaine magic trick, like Lazarus has sort of been wrapped up, put in a tomb. Uh, you know, consider for a moment, Lazarus had been wrapped up, put in a tomb, four days without air, without water. Maybe it was a setup. Well, look, verse 19, many Jews had come to mourn. In verse 21, the immediate family, they're wailing. The sister says to Jesus, if only you'd been here. When Jesus tells her, well, your brother will rise again, Martha replies, verse 24, she says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day, you know, at the end of time. You see, absolutely nobody was in on this. Nobody was expecting Jesus to do what he did. Lazarus was dead, dead. And you know, it's hard not to be, to feel moved by the sister's pain in this passage, they say the same thing. Do you see in verse 21, Martha, if you'd been here, if only you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. In verse 32, Mary falls at his feet. If only you'd been here. If only. Can you empathize with those words? If only. If only something had been different. If only that hadn't happened. If only they'd left an hour later, if only, if only, if only. They're words that we speak when we long for the tragedy not to be true. Jesus, he looks at, into this tragic scene of death. And it's here that we get the shortest sentence in the whole Bible. And yet it is a sentence that is loaded with importance. Did you see it in verse 35? Jesus wept. The creator of life weeps at death. You know, when we, when we see Jesus weeping at Lazarus' tomb, we know for certain that God is not some uninvolved, distant deity who is unfamiliar and untouched with our suffering and our pain. God has stepped meaningfully into our world in the person of Jesus and he weeps with us at the presence of death. Try and imagine for a moment his face weeping, the tears welling up in his eyes, rolling down his cheeks, and know that God feels our pain. Every single funeral you've ever sat in, God was in that room weeping with you. God will not let the story end there. He will not. What happens in chapter 11 is Jesus steps forward towards that tomb. This is now a great face-off between two giants. Jesus on one side, death on the other. Death, the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Death, who rules our world. Death, who listens to no one. The earth stands still. Verse 43. Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And instantly, instantly, a breath is drawn into flat lungs. A cold heart starts to beat. Organs grow back into place. Closed eyes open. The crowd simply see a wrapped body flinch. And it's like time stops moving. It's like gravity in the room changes. It's like they just stepped into a different dimension, although this time it's for all of the right reasons. Death was just knocked out with a single punch. Death was just put into its place. Death just listened to its master. Now you try this yourself in a graveyard, it doesn't work. You go out there, you find the most important, powerful person in the world right now, get them to try it, it doesn't work. You get anybody else in all of human history to go into a graveyard and try this. It doesn't work because death doesn't listen to us. But here we see death listens to Jesus. Jesus simply speaks and death simply obeys. Martin Luther once said that if Jesus hadn't called out Lazarus by name, then all the tombs in all the world would have shook open. Such is the power of his voice. 
And you know, this is one of the many moments where the suggestion that Jesus is just a good teacher has to be obliterated from the conversation. Where this theory that Jesus was just a good bloke has to be torn up into shreds. C.S. Lewis said that we can call Jesus a devilish fraud or we can fall at his feet and call him Lord, but we can't say he was just a good teacher because he hasn't left that option open to us. Did you see the words that Jesus spoke to Martha in verse 25? Just before he publicly raises Lazarus, he has this quiet moment. We're in our series in the I Am statements, and we, we've seen that Jesus has said he's the bread of life. He's the, I, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He said, I am the gate to heaven. He said, I am the good shepherd. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. This is one of the most monumental I am statements, and it's delivered not to a crowd, but to one grieving woman. In a personal, intimate exchange, Jesus speaks these world-transforming words with her one-to-one, face-to-face. It's as if we might imagine Jesus saying these words to us, one-to-one and face-to-face. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you know that death rules over you, but I rule over death? I am the resurrection and the life. And you see, Jesus, when he says this, he he isn't claiming to, this is important, he isn't claiming to access some sort of ancient power over death that lives outside of himself that we might be able to access in other ways. He's not claiming to be a human prophet who asks God for help. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. These are wild words. And these are not just empty words. Because Jesus proves his words time and time again by his actions. He calls Lazarus out of the tomb to show us that he is the real deal. Here, for the first time, speculations about life after death become observations. All of those, the the, the biblical promises about resurrection at the end of time, they historically materialize into observations. As Rico Teich used to say, Jesus proves that the coffin is not an exitless box. Oh, how the 68% of Brits fearfully avoiding, ignoring death need to hear this. How those people that are trying to embrace death, smiling through their tears, need to hear this. How those trying to fight death with their kale smoothies need to hear this. How we in the room today, with all of our fears and our tears, need to hear this. Jesus asks Martha such a penetrating question. It's the same question he asks us today. Four penetrating words. There at the end of verse 26. Look down. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Either everything on earth ends in death and it's all meaningless anyway, or Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Like a highly trained barrister, John is bringing evidence upon evidence about who Jesus is. He lines up the evidence for us, but we have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. Do you believe this? You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus' salvation, it is not automatically applied to your life. Jesus has punched a way through death. He has made a way to forgive your sins. He has made a way to restore your relationship with God in eternity, but that is not That is not automatically applied to your life. Verse 25, the one who believes in me will live. Do you believe this? You see, the actions and the words of Jesus, they demand a response. 
the most important decision any individual will ever make is their response to the claims of Jesus Christ. I borrowed that sentence from a preacher and a sermon that I can't even remember. But when I was looking into the faith myself, someone said that exact formulation of words and I've never forgot them. (laughs) The most important decision any individual will ever make is their response to the claims of Jesus Christ. You see in verse 45, we see that many in the crowd believed that day. How could you not? But then we also see in verse 53, one of the most tragic, and I have to say comedic responses to Jesus. Tragically comedic, perhaps. You see, they've literally just witnessed that Jesus has power over death. They've literally just seen him call out a dead man from his tomb using his words. What's their response in 53? Have a look. Let's kill him. I mean, this is full-blown, wheels-off crazy, right? Do you think anybody put up their hands and said, I think I've got a couple of questions about this. Like, do you, do I think we might have a problem here. You know the story. Those that didn't like Jesus, they get the most elite executioners of the day. They capture him, they torture him, they stick him up on a cross. They stab him, they puncture his lungs and his heart, they wrap him up, they stick him in a tomb, they dust their hands of him. He walks out three days later. Jesus cannot be swallowed by death. Jesus cannot be told what to do by death. Do you know why? Death does not tell Jesus what to do. Jesus tells death what to do. Death rules over us, but Jesus rules over death. And Jesus is calling you today to believe in him. Do you believe this? And let me encourage you, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, I I hope you feel that I've given a soft touch. I've said, why don't you come back? Why don't you find out more? Let me say today... Do not wait around. Remember this jar of marbles. The truth is, I know it feels morbid. I know we don't like to go there, but just face the reality for a moment. The truth is, this could well be your final year on earth, your final month, your final day. What are you waiting for? The old preacher Augustine once said, God has promised you forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised you tomorrow to your procrastination. This is urgent. Perhaps you've been coming to church for months or years. You've been listening. You've been sitting on the fence. Perhaps you've been listening at home. You're deciding not to decide. Let me plead with you to come to Jesus right now. Stop messing around with your eternity. Stop messing around. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Ask him to give you his Holy Spirit. Ask him to rescue your soul from hell for heaven. Ask and you'll receive. Knock, the door will be opened. Believe in the one who shook open Lazarus' tomb. Do you believe this? Let me end with this. I wonder if you know how they categorize Shakespeare plays. You didn't see that coming. But do you know how they categorize Shakespeare plays? There's two categories. If it ends with a wedding, it's a comedy. If it ends with a funeral, it's a tragedy. What story are you in? How do you want your story to end? Let me pray. Dear God, we tremble We tremble in appropriate fear before the one who holds the keys to life and death, to heaven and hell. We marvel at the one who called Lazarus out of the grave, the one who walked out of his own grave and calls us to believe in him and to follow him. Father, I simply ask that each of us would hear Jesus' voice this morning when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.